This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis and my co-host is my amazing service dog, Lovey. And we're excited to be with you today to talk about, you know it, our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today we're welcoming Andrea Martini a guide dog mobility instructor from Guiding Eyes for the Blind that's based in Yorktown Heights, New York. And we have a lot to talk about today regarding their guide dog program, including how they've gotten really creative during the COVID-19 pandemic and how they train guide dogs for their human partners who are blind and who are even into running. I've always been curious about how trainers prepare new guide dogs for that task. So can't wait to talk to Andrea all about that today. So come right back after these quick messages as we welcome Andrea Martini from Guiding Eyes for the Blind to the show. Pets are part of the family. Make sure you can always afford the quality health care they need with Easy Pet Check. A nationwide pet insurance alternative, with Easy Pet Check, you'll save up to 75% on all your pet's health care at any licensed veterinarian in the U.S. Easy Pet Check accepts all dogs and cats, regardless of pre-existing conditions. Visit EasyPetCheck.com. That's the letters EZPetCheck.com. Taking care of your pet can be easy with Easy Pet Check. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Hello, Andrea, and welcome. Marcy, hello, and I just want to fangirl for a second. I know we have so much to talk about. I just love your show and what you're doing. You are not only educational, but so entertaining. And I've been binge listening, which I didn't even know was a thing when I was introduced to your show. And now I'm sharing your show with colleagues and graduates. So thank you so much for your work. You're so kind, Andrea. Well, I have such a girl crush on trainers. (laughs) I love trainers. Well, I love all people associated with assistance dog programs. I just do. But the trainers are like the goddesses of the program of, of how you work your magic and what you do with these amazing, amazing canines and the people because it's such a, an interesting and, and unique skills to really work with canines and with humans with disabilities and challenges. So I just can't wait to hear all about the work you're doing. And I want to ask you, please start out by telling our listeners a little bit about Guiding Eyes for the Blind. Well, that would be my pleasure. And, you know, it's great to be a trainer. uh, But as you are well aware, it really takes a village of remarkable people. Not only are the people whom we service who show such courage and resiliency every single day, but all of our volunteers and and our donors who um, yes. you know make this possible. So it really does take a village. And I feel so honored to be a trainer because I get to be part of the process and a really unique part of the process where I get to work with the team. I often feel like that um, there was a cell phone commercial that you know had a person representing the network and all of these people behind them. And that's how I often feel when I'm working with a team, that there's so many people behind me that made possible the work that I get to do with the person I'm working with, the team that I'm working with. So I'm from Guiding Eyes for the Blind, as you said. We're about 35 miles north of Manhattan, and we are passionate about connecting exceptional dogs with blind and visually impaired guide dog handlers. And the thing I think I'm most proud about Guiding Eyes, we have a really long, proud history of innovation. We were 
the first guide dog school to have a dedicated program that works with individuals who have a disability in addition to blindness or a need that requires their dog to have additional training outside of the training that our incredible guide dogs already have. So it's a really long, a long history, and we're still one of the only schools that have a dedicated program. We also were one of the first schools to have a home training program where we train individuals in their home area, and we still have that program. I actually work in the program. It's called the Specialized Training Program, and I'm a trainer in that program. So we work with individuals who are deafblind, individual that may have uh, cognitive needs or physical needs, anything that would require a guide dog for mobility to have additional training. So the school really dedicates a lot of resources and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, And we just have some uh, remarkable recipients and graduates of our program. Yeah, I love that. I love that you guys are flexible and innovative because as we know, disability takes on so many different forms and our needs are so different. And I just love that. And just tell our listeners how long you guys have been doing this. I mean, guide dogs are just, I mean, they're the epitome to me of the working dog. They just, what they do and how they make decisions, how they move through the world with their partner is just, it's so magical. I mean, it just really is. I love to just watch a team work through and move through the world and how they do that. So tell us how long you guys have really been doing this work. Well, Guiding Eyes was founded in 1954, and the specialized training program, we began working with individuals who were deaf and hearing impaired probably in the 1970s. And then we, in 1989, is when we formed that our specialized training program. And I myself, like, like you, I am still, I've been in the work for, I started around when you got your first dog, from what I understand. I raised a puppy in 1991. I was a teacher <laughs> and uh, I had too had admired admired guide dog teams uh, and that work. And then I joined the staff in 1995. And I am, I never cease to be awed, truly. Uh, That's not a corny statement. Um, I'm really awed by our teams. And and as your show has, has really pointed out, we're just at the tip of the iceberg about how dogs can work with us and their capabilities. So guide work is unique. And yet the possibilities of what dogs are doing for your listeners is endless. And we see that all the time. So I thank your admiration, um, but I also have mutual admiration for really the whole service dog industry and for your listeners who are so dedicated, even with their pet dogs, that are so dedicated to working on that relationship with canines. It's it's really remarkable. I was going to say, Andrea, you nailed it. It's that relationship because it is such a powerful bond that is really hard to articulate. When people ask me about it, it's like I I am still so impressed and mesmerized by it every day after I've had a dog, like you said, for the, for the almost 30 years, but it is, it is just so unbelievable how they show up every second of every day to be by their person's side and to give that support in, in all those different ways. Tell us about your typical client and what kinds of tasks they need a guide dog to perform. Absolutely. So, gosh, the first thing that came to mind is we really don't have any typical client. (laughs) The the neat thing about service work, as you know, it's all about the match. And the coolest thing that is there's not one perfect dog for every single handler. And that's what's so important is, is making the match, really getting to know the person and their needs and what type of dog is going to work for them the best. So there really is a process of matching a dog with handler. But I will touch a little bit. I think um, I know one of your things that you're really curious about is our deafblind graduates. Yes. And people are often just odd. A person who's deafblind, I think still to this day, there are limiting beliefs about deafblind people that perhaps hearing blind people experienced decades ago. There's still a lot of misconceptions about deafblind people. They live really active uh, lives and technology has increased their accessibility. 
And having said that, deafblind people have, they have unique needs that require unique thoughts about how they interact with their world and especially about using a guide dog. So anyone who knows about guide dogs, as many of your listeners do, you know that they use their voice, you use your voice, uh, voice commands, the tone of your voice is so important. That's how you're trained in communicating with your dog. And many of our deafblind individuals, especially those who are deafblind since birth, they don't use their voice. They may not have voice to use. So it really, you know, when people are think, oh, that's so amazing. You can't train deafblind people because they can't use their voice. Well, dogs are nonverbal themselves. They communicate nonverbally all the time. And so we as humans just had to figure out the tools that we could give our deafblind handlers. So for example, the easiest example I can come up with is uh, praise and getting the dog's attention. So our deafblind handlers, instead of using verbal praise, they tap their right hand to their right thigh quickly uh, about four to five times. And that's praise. That's condition. That's yes, my it is. Get them the all dog. excited, I bet. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then to get the dog's attention or to say their name, it would just be two taps to their right thigh. And then their work pattern, they need to be trained with a different work pattern, with a different set of skills. And the training takes uh, for a deafblind individual and for actually for everyone in our specialized training program, the training is generally two to three times longer uh, than it would take to train a guide dog for a blind individual. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable. Yeah. Well, tell us, how did you train a guide dog to be partnered with someone who is a runner? I just can't wait for you to talk about that. I've wanted to know that. That is so cool. How did you train the dog and prepare the dog for that activity? Absolutely. So this is this was a task. So this is, I believe, the only program in the United States and, and perhaps anywhere um, yet to train dogs to run with um, visually impaired and blind individuals with our graduates. And it really was so interesting years ago when our current chief executive officer, Thomas Panic, he is a guide dog handler, a guide dog user. And he was an is an avid runner. He still is. And he's done many marathons. And he tasked our training department with, could we do this? And of course, we had so many questions. There's a lot to consider when considering asking a dog to run with a blind individual and to actually have some working responsibility. And we wanted to make sure, of course, that we were considering the dog and their capabilities. Not every dog can be a running guide. So the first thing that we look for is the trainers, when they're training their dogs, they look to see if they feel that their dog may enjoy running, just running. <sighs> and again, there's not every dog is cut out to be a running guide, and we would not ask them to do that work. Then we have, once a trainer says, I really think my dog would enjoy not only guide work, but running with someone, they're evaluated. We have a dedicated team of trainers. There's three trainers that evaluate running guides and then run with them on a regular basis. There are criteria. So you wouldn't run with a guide dog in a really busy, crowded environment because guide dogs have to make decisions very quickly and if your pace is really fast, they may not be able to move the handler as well. So a lot of training goes in and uh, just like walking pace, I don't know if your listeners may know that dogs are matched with their handlers based on the pace that they walk. People walk anywhere from about 1.9 miles an hour to about 4.3 or 4.4 miles an hour. Every person has a different pace that they run at. Some dogs are flexible on their pace, both walking and running, and some dogs have a pace that's a stride that they're very comfortable with within that range. So the dog is matched with the person based on that. That's one of the factors in the matching process. Beautiful. I love to hear about that matching process because there is so much that goes into that that people really aren't aware of. And I just love how you you described that process because you made it sound so simple, Andrea, and clear, 
But yet I have such respect for it because it is such a critical piece of the success of that team of exactly what you said of making sure that the dog enjoys and finds joy in that work. And then it's so awesome when the dog has that joy and the person has that joy and to bring that together where they can both experience it together. That's when the magic happens. Yeah, that's it. It really does. And it's what's really neat about it is that that innovation also brought about some other innovations. So I know one of your other shows, you were talking about harnesses and the how that they have evolved over the years. And it was actually through our running guides program and getting that up and going that Guiding Eyes partnered with Roughware. And Roughware spent a lot of time developing a harness that would be better, really, for dogs to run in. And then as we were developing this harness, we also realized this is a great harness to use as an option for our guide dog users who don't run. So it's just neat how sometimes innovation breeds more innovation, breeds more innovation. It does. It does. It's like, yeah, it's just it like it snowballs and in a very positive way. Yes, I love it. I love Rough Wear, too. I have some of their products for Lovey. Yeah, absolutely. I love them. Well, we are going to take just a quick break and hear some important messages from our sponsors that we love. And we want you to come back because we have so much more to talk about with Andrea. So stay put and we'll be right back. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There's no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Radio.com, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Pet <laughs> Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And we're visiting today with Andrea Martini from Guiding Eyes for the Blind. And Andrea, you just have so much wonderful information to share with us. And I do want to ask you, does Guiding Eyes have their own breeding program? Where do you get your dogs from? And do you only train guide dogs with their other career placements for your dogs? Yes, we have our own canine development center. And the reason for that is we really breed for health and temperament. So many, many years ago, uh, we did many years ago at our founding, we did use dogs from shelters, but we really are breeding for, you know, purpose bred dogs for guide work specifically. And our breeding program, another just proud history is we have uh, really remarkable geneticists. We had the first uh, cryogenics lab in the country. We have a long history of uh, our breeding program sharing breeding stock. We were actually the first school to start sharing breeding stock with other guide dog organizations uh, and really participating in studies, working with the University of Pennsylvania very carefully. So we really, yes, we have our own breeding program. And even all the work that goes into breeding, we still have dogs who are not suitable for guide work. We do work with several other service dog organizations that can adopt our dogs who aren't suitable for guide work, but are still would be wonderful working animals. They may not have the confidence for guide work. We're just developing now, we're starting to work with the Lighthouse in Chicago and placing dogs with visually impaired and blind youth and their families, like a buddy dog, a companion dog. Mm -hmm. They're not guide dogs, but just to get people used to working or not working with, but living with and taking care of Yeah, yeah. 
getting I comfortable around dogs. So dogs who have had all these advantages, you know, our, our dogs start training almost right after they're born. They're handled so carefully. And then they have these remarkable volunteers who raise them, our puppy raisers. We have puppy raisers all along the eastern seaboard and uh, we have all the way over to Ohio, as far west as Ohio. So all the way up from Maine down to North Carolina, over to Ohio. We have a small group in Colorado where one of our regional guide dog mobilities instructors is located. She has a group of raisers there. So these dogs are just, you know, they've been handled um, so carefully. So just because they can't be guide dogs doesn't mean that they're working, that a working life may be over for them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I was wondering about that. That's why I was asking if you had other career placement opportunities for them. Because as we talked about, I know guide dogs, in my opinion, they're the hardest, really, for the dogs that have to have the most skills and the most ability. So I can see where you would, even though you have a breeding program, you would have a lot of dogs that weren't necessarily suited for that kind of work for multiple reasons. And so I could see that you would have dogs that you would need to place or find other opportunities for or homes for. And I'm sure you have a long list of people that would want to adopt some of those dogs too. Our listeners are always asking me about that, Andrea, of how can they get on those lists to get dogs that don't get placed um, with someone but might need a home. And I actually have one of those dogs myself who I adore. Aww. Yes. Is that, is that Whistle or another um, dog? No, it's actually Humphrey. And Humphrey was an assistance dogs of the West dog, but he had some medical issues. And I was so fortunate that I got the opportunity to adopt him. And he is just a wonderful dog. And he does some work for me at home, which is awesome. So I feel like I'm the luckiest girl in the world because I literally have three working dogs in my house right now. Oh, that is really fantastic. So I'm so glad you asked because people, there's so much information. You and I could talk all day and beyond. Our website is guidingeyes.org. That's G-U-I-D-I-N-G-E-Y-E-S.org. And there is information about adopting our dogs. So basically what happens if a dog is not suitable for guide work or for another service dog organization, the first person we give option of adopting that dog is the puppy raiser, the volunteer who raised them. Yes. Us, a lot of times or sometimes our raisers actually don't adopt their dog back because we have so many incredible puppy raisers who raise again and again and again. So they don't want to continue taking in dogs. So we do have a waiting list. Um, it's pretty lengthy waiting list for a dog who does not become a guide dog or another type of service dog. But there is information on our website about how to apply. You just have to be patient because it, yes. it does take a while. Yes, uh, it's worth the wait, though. Yes, yes, it is definitely worth the wait. Well, I want you to tell us, you guys have been so innovative with how you've been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want you to share with us a little bit about that, about how you're working with clients during the pandemic and dealing with placements and, and even training your dogs in public. Tell us how COVID-19 has impacted you guys. Oh my goodness, like everyone else, it's impacted us tremendously. And we are not back up as normal, quote unquote normal. We're really, really fortunate to be led by leadership who is putting the safety of everyone at the forefront while still trying to continue our services. So the really neat thing is we never slowed down. When we had to be quarantined, we immediately got together and we created a lot of task forces to deal with how were we going to, when we return to work, do this safely. So a lot of committees were formed. We also got some really neat work done on, you know, all of us in the service dog world, we wear so many hats and we often lack time to really focus on special projects. We were able to really get some special projects started and um, some really neat work came out of that. And again, I think because we we have always been, innovation's always been very supported here by leadership 
and innovators, a lot of ideas were thrown around. We immediately started looking into technology that would assist us in being able to continue services because we are dedicated to our teams. We don't just train a team and then never see them again. We are dedicated. We have a really dedicated follow-up services. We have regional guide dog mobility instructors, professional trainers who live throughout the United States, Arizona, Colorado, uh, New York, New England area, Michigan, and so that they can get to guide dog teams very quickly. They're the ones who do the home interviews, the in-person home interviews when an individual applies for a guide dog. And they do a lot of the follow-up work as well as our guide dog mobility instructors that work out of our training center in Yorktown Heights. So we immediately started looking at technology that could continue to support our teams. We, again, we've had that home training program. So we really found that for the first, we stopped our residential training program, and we're just starting in a very limited, safe way to bring students back to the residential program. The trainings that have taken place after quarantine, after it was allowed, were home trainings. And of course, we followed all protocol. One of the neat innovations was the school invested pretty early on in the pandemic in a motor coach so that we could safely transport our dogs to our regional guide dog mobility instructors. And when an area was safe to travel in for the blind individual, and of course, at their comfort level also, many blind individuals are not that comfortable traveling. Some don't have that option. They have work to get to. and But many blind individuals, as we are, I've my life has totally changed um, in what I and what we all do. As people were comfortable and uh, we, of course, follow all safety protocols, we began training in people's home areas. Our residential program is just starting back up. Um, the motor coach was specially outfitted to travel with dogs. Um, <laughs> I love that that mobile program. I saw that actually and just thought that was so cool and so smart. And I wondered how outfitted that was. Did you guys, did, was that just something that you purchased or did you rent it? An opportunity became available because, of course, if you remember early in the pandemic, those were going like hotcakes. Yeah. Purchasing, um, <laughs> you know, RVs and, and motorhomes. This came up really kind of, as I understand it, kind of by accident, a really just great opportunity. Somebody had ordered it and then changed their mind and it was nearby and leadership decided this would be a really great way. So there was like a little, there's an area in the RV that was specially because we were transporting, our first transport was five dogs. We did have crates for safety in transport. It's really funny though, because to me, it really looks like, you know, a rock star type of vehicle. It's a really <laughs> beautiful vehicle. Um, if yes. you have seen pictures of it. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's just is funny for a nonprofit organization, you know, that you feel like a rock star. Um, well, they but are rock stars. The dogs are rock stars. I You're think it's totally right, appropriate. Marcy. <laughs> yes. You're right. Yeah. They should travel in rock star style. Absolutely. They yes. <laughs> and they did. And there was the people who transported one was a guide dog mobility instructor. And it just so happened to be her husband is a certified driver, a truck driver. So they were the ones who transported the dogs and they had special, you know, breaks for the dogs. And they stopped in Louisville for, you know, to meet one of the, where one of our regional guide dog mobility instructors is, and then went to Colorado and they stopped in Chicago. So they really made this journey. And all of your listeners know that the journey of life is sweeter uh, with a dog. And uh, as was the this journey. <laughs> And was really exciting. Some of the dogs were not placed immediately because we had to wait again until areas were safe. But then the, when the regional guide dog mobility instructors were able, so they, they fostered the dogs and continued their training. And then as soon as they were able, they, they placed those dogs with some of our applicants and our, our graduates. I just thought that was such an innovative and smart way to respond to the need right now because we have to do things so differently, which is part of living with a disability. That's one of the beauties of it is that you really learn how to be flexible because you have to be and how to adapt. So I just thought this was 
fun and also a great training because I travel so much and I love when I have a dog that is already accustomed to traveling. So what an awesome road trip and experience that was. I just loved it. I thought that was really smart and I think other programs will start doing that because it, it is a really realistic and effective way to do it, to offer those services and continue the training. I love it. Well, I know our time is getting really limited here and there's another question I want to ask you, Andrea, and this is something that our listeners always want to know and that is tell us how you got started working as a trainer and how you have your awesome job now. Oh my goodness. Thank you for asking. So first of all, all the trainers on our training staff, we all come from different backgrounds, some from um, very heavily animal-based. Myself, I was a psychology major. I was 98.9% sure I was going to be a psychologist. And following university, I took a job as a working with deaf blind, developmentally disabled adults at the Jewish Guild for the Blind in Manhattan. And I had worked with horses. I was a horseback rider. I showed um, hunter jumpers and always loved our, you know, our family animals. When I was younger, I was sure I was going to be a veterinarian, but then just became very interested in people and psychology. And so really, if you had asked me, you know, would I end up a trainer? I would have said no. I sort of fell into it. I raised a puppy in 1991 for Guiding Eyes, and I fell in love with the organization. I learned, I knew a lot about animals, but raising a puppy to be a service dog, you learn so much more. So I learned so much from from raising that puppy. And then I loved my teaching job, but I thought, wow, I could be selfish and work with (laughs) animals and people. Yes. Sort of how I ended up. And I took a big chance. Every guide dog school in the United States has their own apprenticeship program. So typically they're about three years. And the same with the UK, they have apprenticeship programs all over the world. It's really on the job training. Typically, you are not hired as a trainer. Typically, a lot of times you start out in the kennel working, you work in the kennel for three days, you follow trainers for a day, and you work in the vet hospital for a day. So you work in as, as a trainer's assistant, really. And then when a position opens up, Uh, a training position, um, people apply that way. Occasionally, trainers are hired with their experience. uh, They're hired on, but you still have, it's such unique work that you still have that apprenticeship program that you go through, but you are working with dogs and people all throughout that apprenticeship program. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely consistent with what I've heard from people all over the world, as you said, that it is that on the job training apprenticeship that really has to to happen. Although now there is the Bergen University, but there really aren't that many programs that I've seen, at least, Andrea. So that's why I was interested in your path to hear what how you had gotten to where you are. And it's hard. That's why it's, you know, it's hard and it's not a lot of money, especially starting out. And so you really do have to have that passion and commitment to really have a long-term career. At least this is my perspective and opinion from what I've seen. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Um, And the neatest thing for myself when I was first starting out, I was so naive. I wondered if I would become bored at some point. Oh, you learn how to train a dog and then are you going to be bored? Like, you know, time to make the guide dog, time to make the donuts kind of thing. But it's anything but. There has never been a dull moment in my life. And every team, I still am learning, you know, our training techniques have changed so much since uh, the 1990s. And even since last year, and I learned from my graduates, I learned from service dog users, our school is really committed to continuing education. So the school invites uh, professional trainers, and we work with them to see what we can apply to our own training to to make the training better for the dogs and better for our recipients of our dogs. So I, I really, I'm just so proud of Guiding Eyes because, again, it's that innovative spirit and uh, wanting to encourage education, continuing education for us. So if anyone's worried about ever becoming bored as a trainer, you never, no. there's always something new that pops up. Yes. Uh, and you can attest to that as a service dog user, I'm sure. Your first dog Absolutely. is way different. Your third dog is way yes. different. <laughs> and I'm way different. Like you said, I've learned so much. Everyone, it's, I'm sure it's like children, how you start out with your first one and then your last one. But 
Yes, it is such a growing industry. And as I said, I just think we're at the tip of the iceberg of what these dogs can do for us and how we can interact with them. I think we're we're really just on the forefront. Exactly. And our own capabilities, you know, every dog and every person, they learn so differently. And that's the neat challenge as a trainer and an instructor is how you, you know, there are basic training, of course, that there's basic rules there, there's science behind what we do. But beyond the science, there's all those nuances about how each dog and how each person really learns. So that's the challenge as a trainer is to always be open minded to find what's going to motivate that person, what's going to motivate that dog, how are they best going to learn the task that you are hoping they're going to learn, that you want them to learn. So it's really, it's just such, like I said, never a dull moment, right, Marcy? So true. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I really feel so fortunate every day because I still feel like these relationships are evolving. And like you said, there's so much opportunity for growth and continuing education and development and and strengthening that bond. It's just, yeah, it's just awesome. There's, it's just one of the best things on the planet. It really is, at least in my opinion. And I I say that with such love and humility, because it it really is. And And it sounds like that's your experience. I'm saying it as someone who needs and benefits from the services that the dog and the trainer provides. But it sounds like we're totally in sync with that from your perspective it's absolutely really you said it beautifully oh andrea well i could talk to you all day but i know you're so busy that we're gonna have to let you go but andrea i hope you will come back and be with us again we want to hear more about the incredible work that guiding eyes is doing we have such admiration for the program and all the staff the volunteers donors as you said the whole village that comes together um, so beautifully to make the work that these dogs do possible for people with disabilities is just so wonderful. Well, Marcy, again, right back at you. You're doing really great, important work. The topics you've covered, and yes, I could talk with you all day. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was so honored to, I have so many interesting colleagues and graduates who would be great on your show. And so I'm, I'm happy to represent, and I hope I did my best to represent all of the incredible people that I work with. Thank you, Andrea. You're amazing. And tell us really quick, one more time, Andrea, tell us that web address that you mentioned earlier. Yes, absolutely. It is guidingeyes.org, or you could search for Guiding Eyes for the Blind. And anyone could feel free to email me at a m-a-r-t-i-n-e at guidingeyes.org if you have any questions. It's just been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. And thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We love to hear from you. So please keep your emails coming. And you know you can reach me at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. So thanks so much for being with us. And we look forward to being with you again very soon. Take good care. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.